Hi, I'm Dr. Greg Hunley, Director of the Pauley Heart Center at VCU Health in Richmond, Virginia, and thank you for joining us for our video, COVID-19 Cardiovascular Patient Frequently Asked Questions in Telemedicine. Now, by now, you've likely heard a great deal about the cardiovascular impacts of this severe respiratory virus and the disease it causes, COVID-19. VCU Health is at the forefront of research and innovation and doing our part to understand this disease. And today I have the privilege of introducing a couple of our cardiologists to share some of the most pressing concerns related to cardiovascular disease. Today we have Dr. Jeremy Turlington, one of our poly cardiologists that is duly board certified in both cardiovascular medicine as well as critical care medicine, meaning that he takes care of a lot of patients with severe disease in our intensive care units. And also Dr. Haim Bardwaj, who is director of our echocardiography lab and also takes care of patients and directs our inpatient service line for patients with cardiovascular disease. So first, we're gonna start with Dr. Turlington. So Jeremy, if I as a patient have heart disease, how do I differentiate symptoms of heart disease from perhaps symptoms associated with this COVID-19 disease? Thank you for the uh, introduction, Dr. Hunley, and thank you for the question. It's a great question that comes up a lot, and I've had some patients ask me that directly, um, or even page me in the middle of the night for these same kind of questions. A lot of what it comes down to is if you have a history of heart disease, you need to remember the types of symptoms you've had when you had whatever event led you to this. So typically we think about the substernal or central chest pain that's deep, that's usually very aching or heaviness, pressure-like sensation. But remembering that not everybody has the same type symptoms. With, they may also have symptoms of shortness of breath, palpitations, nausea, sweating, radiation of pain to the jaw, down the arm, and, and similar type symptoms, or that's what we normally ask for. Um, but when it comes to the, the COVID-19 coronavirus, a lot of this is more based on shortness of breath. And a lot of these patients have coughs and fevers and a lot of fatigue. Now there is a lot of overlap. We have patients who have a lot of heart failure type symptoms and they may have some shortness of breath, fatigue, inability to exert themselves. But I think a lot of the difference needs to first be thinking about what type of symptoms you've had in the past, and timing is really key. A lot of our patients with cardiac issues have a certain amount of exertion or certain activity they can do that will provoke symptoms, and it, it can be gradual over time. The COVID symptoms are usually more time limited, and I don't mean that specifically, but over a week or two, you start feeling more fatigued, you start having a cough, Fever is a big one that we really don't see a lot of during an acute cardiac issue. Um, and, and it's not really brought on by if I walk three flights of stairs or I push my lawnmower. It's, it's just this progressive symptoms with cough. A lot of people will say things such as cold or flu-like illness. I don't want to focus on a cold or flu. This is more severe than that. However, think about those kinds of symptoms and think other symptoms that have been brought up by the CDC and WHO recently lack of smell, lack of taste, those symptoms have been added to the, uh, the laundry list of symptoms for COVID-19 that have been um, studied more recently, and that might lead you more down that pathway. Again, though, if you're having chest pain, acute shortness of breath, or any other worrisome symptom, we really want you to call 911 or get to the closest emergency room, because these are all serious symptoms that we don't want to miss out on. Very good. Now, if I have underlying heart disease, am I more likely to get ill or catch COVID? And if I get infected with the virus, is my disease more likely, my cardiac disease more likely to be exacerbated or experience a, a flare up? So th th that's a really interesting thought. And there's a lot of data that has come out as we keep getting more and more patients and more data initially from China, Italy, and now looking at New York and New England Journal just had an article about this uh, a week ago or so. Just because you have heart disease doesn't put you at a seems of predisposition to getting COVID-19. That we still need to work on the things such as social distancing, always washing your hands, wearing a mask if you go in public, watching who you could or could not be exposed to. However, what we have seen more recently is 
Unfortunately, patients who are of older age, over the age of 65, are at increased risk of uh, higher severity or more complexity with the illness. And as the New England Journal article from a week ago, patients who have known coronary artery disease, have hypertension and heart um, failure, usually have more serious symptoms and um, are having to come into the hospital and having a more prolonged uh, illness than those who um, do not have heart disease. Very good. So Dr. Bardwash, I wanna to switch to you and sort of piggybacking on that concept of if you have pre-existing heart disease, many patients with heart failure or high blood pressure are taking a class of medicines called ACE inhibitors. An example would be lisinopril or maybe angiotensin receptor blockers. We call them ARBs, a medicine like Avapro. Should they continue taking these medications? Yes, there has been a lot of controversy in the media about these certain medications that we're using to treat high blood pressure and, high, and heart failure. Um, especially if you get COVID, are you going to have a worse outcome if you're on these medicines? Uh, currently, there's no data indicating that these medications are harmful. Uh, we do not recommend discontinuing those medications. If you have questions about your medications, um, talk to your physician. But at this time, we are not advocating for discontinuing those medications. You should continue them. Right. And what is some of the concept behind why you'd even think about discontinuing them? Well, there's some research out there that says the virus is what those drugs target, the virus also can uh, affects. And so if you get the virus, if you get COVID-19, those medicines will affect your immune system and you just have worse outcomes. Um, we really don't know exactly what, but that's what some of that some of the data is showing, but we don't see any research to that effect now. This is ever evolving. We're learning more about COVID-19 every day, um, but at this point, we do not recommend discontinuing those meds. Right, so basically the position with the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, other international heart and vascular societies do not stop your ACE inhibitors or your ARBs for a set for management of your heart failure Correct. or your hypertension. And we would only do that uh, or even possibly consider that in severe situations where you're very hypotensive that we and would consider blood. stopping those independent of whether you had COVID or not. Correct. For those severe cases where one is hospitalized. Correct. Yeah. So Jeremy, coming back to you, getting on the issue of severity of disease, we know that some patients with COVID have minimal symptoms and others have severe disease, even requiring intubation, pressure support, et cetera. How do you manage these severe levels of disease and are there therapeutic interventions that might look promising for patients with a severe form of disease? Yes, sir. Um, I'm actually in the ICU this week dealing with this very topic. Uh, again, a majority, a vast majority, over 80% of patients have very mild symptoms that don't require hospitalization, really require just staying home and the normal getting rest. However, if a patient comes to us and we bring them into the hospital, there are various levels of, of uh, medications that we can use, or various medications at different levels that we can use to treat these patients. Uh, hydroxychloroquine was one that was initially brought up a lot as an anti-malarial agent to stop uh, virus spread. The data, as we've got, as Dr. Bardwash talked about, we the data evolves every day, and we don't have as much good data with that. the The big medication that comes up right now is remdesivir. It was just approved by the FDA, I think, on Friday of last week. This is another uh, medication that's supposed to block the replication of the virus, and we are using that. That's the great thing about being here part of the VCU Health Center and really being part of the VCU Poly Heart Center is we are actively engaged in a lot of this research. And, and so I can be in the ICU thinking about using one of these medications and call up one of my partners like Antonio Abate, who's helping with leading some of this research. And we can talk about the patient, and which medication may be right. Not only are we looking at blocking the, the viral replication with medications such as remdesivir, but there are also some medications that have been used in, in cancer patients to 
to tamp down the inflammatory response, which is a body's innate response that goes kind of out of whack and, and, and a little bit haywire, for lack of a better term. Medications um, that are called IL-6 blockers. This is a way to stop the inflammation that we see starts to really take hold on these patients about seven days into it. And then finally, we're also working with the Mayo Clinic and with the Red Cross about getting convalescent plasma, which is an idea. This is plasma drawn, blood that has been drawn and separated from patients who have recovered from COVID to actually infuse into patients with COVID to try to give them some better immune response to the disease to help them fight. So we're looking at all of this and then we're doing various modalities using ventilators to help protect the lungs, get the lungs stronger. And we're using all of this and attacking from different methods to try to help these patients through this when they are severely ill. Very good. So it sounds like for severe disease, many therapeutic options are being uh, implemented now and tested and uh, hopefully combating some of the more uh, exacerbated, really, really ill patients uh, that are requiring uh, pulmonary and respiratory support. Yes, sir. Well, Haim, getting back to the patients with cardiac disease and maybe not coming into the hospital, sort of a whole new way of performing visits has evolved called telemedicine or telehealth. So could you tell us a little bit about what telehealth is? And if I'm a patient with cardiovascular disease, how do I prepare for a, a telehealth visit? What does it entail? Um, well, telehealth is a broader term, but both telehealth and telemedicine refer to practicing medicine using technology and delivering care from a distance. So in this time of COVID-19, it really respects the need for social distancing, yet at the same time ensuring all of our patients get the care that they need. Um, for example, at VCU, we have a platform called VCU Health Anywhere, which allows us to seamlessly, as physicians, to seamlessly interact with our patients and still provide that care and still maintain social distancing. Um, the telemedicine clinic visit is very similar to an in-office visit. Um, if a patient is able to take their blood pressure and heart rate, that's helpful for the physician. Um, the physician will either be on the phone or video, it'll be a video visit where we'll ask about symptoms, any change in history, review medications, um, ensure that the patient has the best care plan. Um, and if after that, if after a virtual visit, the patient and the doctor feel like an in-office visit is needed, we are here as well. It, so in-office visits are possible and we're here, but we're just using the VCU platform, the VCU Anywhere, um, VCU Health Anywhere platform to allow for social distancing and still taking care of our patients. How does one get ready for a telemedicine visit? Well, it's helpful to have your medications in front of you or have a list of those medications in front of you so that you can go over them with your doctors. For example, if you're on ARBs or ACE inhibitors, the medicines you, we talked about earlier, if you have questions about that, you can discuss it with your doctor. Um, if you can get your blood pressure or your heart rate, that's helpful. And if you can gather the questions that you have, um, that's the best way to be prepared. Very good. And then how do I arrange an appointment a telemedicine appointment with a poly cardiologist if one's needed? So if you go to our vcuhealth.org webpage, there's a link where you can fill in a request to have a, either a virtual visit or an in-office visit. And then you can learn more about our cardiologist via our poly heart center uh, link from there. But vcuhealth.org, everything is on that page and there's a link on how to get care. and click on that link and it will seamlessly help you either request an in-office visit or a virtual visit. Thank you, Haim. So uh, finally, in closing, Jeremy, thank you and thank Haim for all of your uh, attention here and your time in this busy uh, visiting uh, disease process and, and helping us arrange visits, helping explain the COVID disease and what happens uh, if you're admitted and have severe disease. Is there anything else, Jeremy, that you would like to add? I, I think just it's, it's a good summary. We have patients, we take care of you on a daily basis with your heart disease. Make sure you take your medicines, follow the, 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 the instructions your doctor's giving you to take good care of yourself. And if you have any concerns, don't hesitate to call us. 
set up a televisit, set up a telehealth visit, phone visit, and if you have any real concerns, to come to the emergency room if needed so we can best take care of you. Many options about trying to take care of you at home or here in the hospital to not only protect you from your heart and your heart issues in general, but from the COVID-19 pandemic at the same time. Very good. And Dr. Bardwash, any closing comments? Yeah, I would just like to reiterate what both you and Dr. Turlington have said. Uh, these are unprecedented times, but VCU has really taken efforts to ensure patient safety. And we are here. We don't want patients to stay home. If you're having symptoms, like you said, call 911. Our emergency room is open. We are here to take care of patients. And if you need to come into the hospital, we'll provide you a mask if you don't have one. We've ensured our waiting rooms and our clinics are socially distant. So we, as patient safety is our number one priority. So please come if you need us. Very good. Well, thank you viewers. And to learn more about VCU Health and this COVID-19 disease, please visit vcuhealth.org slash COVID hyphen 19. Thank you everyone.